Thank you very much. I've got quite a lot of slides, so I'm going to kind of rattle through it a bit. I'm a timekeeper. I'll slow down if I'm sort of like, if I get a chance. Good eye on you. It's lovely, lovely hearing Beth. Lovely because I I grew up on a small holding in between Godolphin Hill and Tregonning Hill, so never knew what granite I was on, but I did totally. Um, yeah, and my parents never knew this, but at one point we did actually scramble down into that quarry when I was very, very young, on top of Bonnie Hill, scared the pants out of myself, but it was like, it was one of the big adventures that we went down there once. So, yeah. so anyway, that was where I came from. I grew up on the Sillies, small holding in Godolphin from when I was about seven years old, and I just had a very privileged, free-range childhood. My dad was a policeman, but he always wanted to be a farmer and we had land and we were kind of just let loose so we grew up <coughs> roving Tregony Hill and Cadolphin Hill and getting lost in the mist and sort of uh, having adventures and building dens on the side of hedges and lighting fires where we shouldn't have lit fires and we just had a lot of fun when we were kids um, but what I just want to talk to you about is hedging and our connection with to start with like our ancestors who were hedging. So as a hedger, I'm still working in a craft that is ancient, is ancient. Hedging came in from our earliest farmers, came into ancient Britain 6,000 years ago. They were starting to do field clearance then. And our, some of our earliest hedges are Bronze Age, so we're sort of talking 4,000 years ago. Um, when they came in as the Bronze Age, they're coming in with craft and craft skill. But what's interesting to me is this phrase intangible heritage that has popped up this year that I've just started to sort of get my head around and it's something I've always been interested in. And it's about the folklore and traditions and knowledge that we have as people. And so for me as a, as a hedger and the hedgers that I work with, one of the particularly interesting things is, is that our connection to kind of our ancient roots. And that ancient field system there, you know, it's 4,000 years old, that's between St Ives and St Just, and I live in St Just, so I drive that coast road whenever I can. It takes twice as long to get to St Ives, but it's so worth it, it's so beautiful. And there's something, there's, there, there's an awe in it, there's a real wonder, you know, these people built these hedges. And I think about it sometimes, and more recently i thought about it a lot, who those people were when they were building those hedges, who they were in their community. And this was a community that had ritual and ceremony and rites of passage and wise elders and all the things that I sometimes feel, in fact, I feel most of the time that we're missing. And um, I feel very privileged that kind of my work within hedging touches these ancestral roots. But this is coming up more and more for me as I kind of, you know, working deeper into this kind of work. This is what's coming up. So... What is interesting, I've, somebody introduced me to this podcast, The Emerald, very recently, and I've been completely addicted to it. I have listened to it so much, and it's fantastic. And it's all about the myths and the stories, and a lot of it is about animism, and how for 99% of our time on Earth, we believed in animism. We believed that things talked. We believed that things spoke. We believed that things were alive. We believe that stones talked and stones sang. And it's something that just, it's something I sort of feel very sort of pulled to at the moment, it's interesting. Indigenous cultures around the world talk about their stones as being ancestors and their ancestors becoming stones. The Aboriginals believe that. The Lakota tribe, the same, the old word for God and stone in the Lakota tribe is the same word. So it's there. Our hedges, in the Bronze Age were built around the same time as Stonehenge. And so the stones were sacred, and it makes me wonder <coughs> how those hedges were built when we believe stone was sacred. And it would definitely be with more honor and respect probably than we build today. But something still happens to us as hedges today when we work that stone, something deeper happens. Anyway, so we go through time. There's a long period of time where we were probably building hedges and we were just building hedges because that's what we did. And then we start to kind of hit the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. We've got the seed drill comes in and man, less labor on the land. There's less people on the land. 
from this point onwards. So what's interesting is that at this point, we're not quite sure of the date of this photo. It comes from the Cornish Hedges Library, probably late 1800s. But what's interesting in that photo on the left is that you've still got a whole community that are interested in looking at this hedge, you know, valuing this hedge. There are boys there looking at men working. It's still got community. And then here we have, this was lovely. There's a little story to this. We were running a training course on the training site in Grumbler in Sandcreed. And an old boy came down and I thought he was going to go over the bank. He was going, I don't know where he was going. I thought, where is he? Went up and found him. He had this in his pocket and he heard us on the radio and came up and he showed us this photo. And this was his competition hedge that he built in Kerrison Pool. He was in his 80s. He'd only sort of just given up hedging, not really kind of quite, he'd only be, you know, he was still hedging well into his 70s. He built that stretch of hedge between 10 o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the afternoon. That's four hours. That's going some. That, for us, that was like, you know, we were quite in awe of that. So that was still happening. That was still happening 60 years ago. Historically, there was a relationship between the ploughing competitions and the hedging so it was the end of the season and this chap he said to us it was something they really looked forward to at the end of the season coming together having a hedging competition and what it did it showcased the craft and the skill in the community there was still that rural community acknowledging this celebrating this valuing it knowing about it knowing that this was a craft so between interestingly between these periods we had World War I that just wiped us out, wiped out the craftsmen right across the board. So we were devastated in terms of the craft and that never really recovered and that's in blacksmithing, hedging, whatever. It's right across the board. So one of the things, when I had children, and I've had three children and they're various ages now, but one of uh, the things that really struck me was my oldest son had a similar childhood to mine. He, I sent him out the door, it didn't matter whether it was raining, he was just kind of booted out and off he went to play. And he, he was great. There was a seven year gap between I ha when I had my other two children <coughs> and I noticed that none of the children went out to play. We moved into a slightly different area. None of the kids went out to play in the woods and they never had what my oldest son had or I had as a child. So this young man here is hedging with us. He's 16, he wants to be a heritage builder. He just got a grant from Heritage Cross for £4,000 to support his, his sort of a career and uh, he's our future, he's our future. But what we've lost, what we've lost in the agricultural world and what we've lost is a place where children, girls and boys have a chance to climb trees, bale head, get used to their body, use their body. It's where the sort of feeling of work begins. And I often think maybe the few places where it still happens are on the farm and probably traveller sites where the kids just run a bit wild and they find out about risk and fear and adventure. Um, so yeah, thoughts. This is a collection of thoughts that have come together. So we're now in this place where we're sort of disconnected from land. Charles Eisenstein talks a bit about this a lot, that we're separate, we have a separateness. And in disconnecting from land and not having that within our roots through school and through childhood and how we grow up in our families, we've got this distance and this lack of belonging. And then with a lack of belonging comes maybe a lack of love for the land. So we're kind of in this place. That hedge is on the training site. So that's our first bit of hedge where we are building through the landscape. So that is a bit of hope there. Okay, David Attenborough quote, this is just, to me, just sums it up completely. You know, we have got to experience stuff. We've got to put our hands on things. We've got to put our hands on stone and earth to feel that connection, to kind of inspire that sort of love so that we do care about the land that we live in. This is the young lad again that's 16, and this was at Cadolphin at the Expo event, and so he's actually working as a demonstration hedger. He came to us, we knew he had a bit of anxiety, and we were just 
And there he was as a demonstration hedger with loads of people talking to him. And it was like, oh my God, what's happened there? So we were really kind of chuffed for him. The other thing about hedges, and this is, this is largely why the work that we're doing is so well supported by partners. Because lots of people have heard this term wildlife corridors. How am I doing on time? Right. I'm all right. Yeah. As Carry in on. what? Halfway through? Yeah. Halfway yeah, yeah. Through. Halfway through. through. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's about halfway through. Because I talk a lot about this. I talk a little bit about this. I, I talk okay. a bit more about this. Talk a bit about yeah. more of this. Okay. Yeah, okay. This is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wildlife Corners. One of the founder members of uh, the Guild of Cornish Hedging, which I'll come on to in a little bit. She talked to me about wildlife corridors and she opened my eyes to it. I was sat in her garden, her garden was full of flowers. She's in her 80s, she's in a wheelchair, but she is so sharp. She is so sharp. Her body's failing, she's just like, but our oh, mind is just on fire still. She said to me, if you imagine the hedge in the landscape, so we got the hedge, we've got five foot of a hedge here, five foot of a hedge here. It's a nice big stock proof hedge on top. She said, you flatten it out, just flatten it out. What she said is you've got a foot of woodland edge and then you've got five foot of stone with rab underneath, subsoil, poor soil, perfect seed bank for wildflowers. There's all your wildflowers. Three foot of hilltop, a bit more fertile, very free draining. You've got your gorse and your hawthorn and everything. You go on to the next five foot and you've got your stone and you've got your wildflowers. Then you've got your foot of woodland edge. You've got 15 foot in the landscape. That's your wildlife corridor. It's not just a hedge, it's a road, it's a motorway. Everything that supports wildlife is in that hedge. It is the landscape. The farms are full of monocrops, pesticides and herbicides a lot. That's, that's the nature of sort of modern farming. This is our sanctuary, the hedges are the sanctuary. And if we think about it like that, they are really seriously significant. Blood risk management, there's a lot of work going on around that and sort of hedges that have been taken out. They're not protected at the moment under the Hedgerow Regulations Act. It was a little bit of, it's not a sort of deliberate thing, it's a little bit of a sort of oversight. So hopefully there's going to be some work that's going to be done around that. But they are so important, they're really important. And this breaks my heart and I can cry at this point. These are the words that were taken out in 2007, out of the, some of the words, some of the words that were taken out of the Oxford Junior Dictionary. All of those words, are about the hedge. They're all about the hedge. There's, there's, there's a whole list of them. The beautiful thing about this work is that Robert McFarlane has recently wrote a book and it is fantastically illustrated. I can't remember if she's called Jackie someone, Jackie Morris or something. Beautiful drawings. And it is called The Lost Words. And basically they've saved these words with beautiful illustrations. But when you, I, that was a list that I found and there was literally three words that I took out that weren't to do with hedges. Everything is hedges. So our children are not seeing this within their literature. What they've got is cut and paste, chat room, what's the other one, Paul band. Those are the words that went in. These are the words that were taken out. So anyway, that's, that's, to me, that's just grief. That's just grief. That's the world we live in. Okay. This is the beginning of hope. So... In 1994, the Cornish Hedges Library was established. There were two wonderful people called Robin Muneer and Sarah Carter. Robin's no longer with us, and I never met him, which is a real shame, but I still see Sarah, his wife, who's the lady that taught, me, taught to me about the wildlife corridors. It's a fantastic resource on hedges and just masses and masses of information and well-researched papers. And they founded the Guild of Cornish Hedges in 2002. And this is early, early photos of apprenticeship work. And this was, they founded this because they knew the craft was in danger at this point. And they had a heritage lottery fund bid that came in in 2007, and they began the work of apprentices with hedging. That scheme ran for quite a long time. That's where I come from. That's where I trained. And my best buddy and partner who sat over there, I won't embarrass him, I think he's in the photo, but yeah, I, think, I was hoping he was in the photo. Anyway, so we, that's where we come from, that's our roots. Um, but, but we weren't a community, we didn't know each other. We just trained as hedges, went off, worked as hedges, we didn't know who each other was. Occasionally we'd come to a raw formal show and stand together and sort of be a bit shy with each other. But we weren't a community at all. 
Um, anyway, we came to get a couple of things happened. Kadroya, if you've heard of Kadroya, the Labyrinth Project. Now that happened, it's like, you know, Will Coleman's a fantastic spokesperson for sort of for hedging, and Golden Tree, his company, were really, really great. And they had this amazing vision. And when they came to this vision, I, thought, I think they thought there was this huge bank of hedges out there. And this work shone the light on the fact that the croft was so endangered. We haven't got the hedges, they're not there. And it was Kudroya's shining <coughs> the light that started to go, oh, hang on a sec, what's happening with this craft? What's happening? Where are our hedges? Mm -hmm. So this happened. Penworth Landscape ran for about five years. It hit COVID, which really knocked it. But it was a fantastic coming together <laughs> of all those key partners, National Trust, Cornwall Council, Caspin, all these, all these kind of bodies coming together that had an interest in the landscape. They pioneered a hedging project as well, and they were our first funder. And our, as our work has gone forwards, it's in legacy of their work as well. So I started teaching a bit in 2022 for the Penrith Landscape Partnership by accident, totally by accident. They started mending a hedge on my field boundary, and uh, it was lovely uh, mending a hedge on the field boundary. They're actually doing it for the neighbour. But I was looking at the hedge and going, oh, it's not very good hedging. Well, you know, everybody's going to think I've done that hedging. So I said, oh, I'm like, do you want me to teach you hedging? And then from there, there that's, that's sort of what happened. It was the fact that they were lovely people and they were just keen. And I just very quietly kind of muscled in to make sure the hedge was going to look all right because I was worried about people thinking it was going to be my hedge. So anyway, here we are today. What happened because of that work, because of Pedroia instigating that and because because of the work that we were doing in the Guild. The craft is now on the red list of endangered crafts, so we're officially endangered. What we've got, though, is a seriously high demand for the work. There are not enough hedges. This is not a fusty, dusty craft that goes in galleries. This is like you, everybody wants hedges built. And um, so it is a viable business. It's a contemporary viable business. We just haven't got enough hedges. So what happened is, out of that coming together of apprentices that had been trained through the guild and we were all working hedges or you know had been working hedges full time part time we came together as a group and formed a new organization that embraced partnership had open arms we needed to work with all those partners we needed to work with the Cornwall area Cornwall area of outstanding natural beauty and Cornwall council and all those key people like the Pembroke Landscape Partnership that were just going, come on, come on, do something with hedging, come on. I think they've been waiting for years and years for this gap to open up. And we sort of realised that if anyone was going to do it, it had to be us. You know, so we had to do this. Otherwise, we just walked away and let our craft die and kind of went off and carried on working. It was, it was a bit of a sort of calling because we started the work and we just kept doing the next right thing. We didn't plan this and it's much bigger than we planned. It was just doing the next right thing. So that's where we are today. Training site at Grumblow and Sancreed. We're teaching courses. We've been doing that all year. And we do that in partnership. These are three ways monkeys here. These are three of the trainers. This is actually at Heligan. We went and did a demonstration day, which I got some photos on later. And there actually there's a fire pit there that's on the break but you know these these are the the but you know we're the team that kind of makes this happen You've got to have a photo of the dog dogs are essential so the dogs are part of the team as well and actually the dogs are a bit of therapy for some trainees actually the dogs really work they sort of sit on the head and some trainees that come and they're a little bit sort of a nervous sometimes the dogs just gravitate towards them so they get dog company and that's good Cornwall Heritage Trust is our main partner and they are fantastic. They've come on board to support us and we're funded by Farming and Protected Landscapes Programme which is run by Cornwall Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. We got a big grant. It's a big project. Scared pants out of us a little bit but actually it's so good. We got a grant for 235,000 to basically because we, you know, there was such a response to the work. So it's an, an ambitious project but we're doing it. This is at Heligan. This is our poster at Heligan. So we're basically doing a showcase piece of work here that will have a sign on so that what we want to do here 
is create word of mouth. So we need to reach Cornish hedges that are across Cornwall. We need to create a little bit of word of mouth, a little bit of a hedge that's talked about. So that was in Killis Stone. And that, we, we had to walk around the estate for quite a long time to find the old heritage hedges to, to build correctly, because there was quite a few sort of modern builds around it that weren't, weren't actually authentically correct for the estate. So this was the old style, and this is what we rebuilt training courses so this is what we're doing now and we have such a range of ability it is so suited hedging is so suited to such a range so i love this photo here on the right this young man here his grandfather uh, is a farmer he, this this lad here has learning uh, difficulties but he and I think he's going to be with us a very long time. I think it's going to take him quite a long time. But what's lovely, if, if you took this young man and you put him back 100 years, he'd be your hedger in the landscape. He would be earning an income. He would be valued on the farm. He would have a place. And you'd want loads of them because there's loads of hedges to build. You know, he's, and at the moment, he's floating. He's left college and he hasn't really bored and, you know, sort of because he hasn't got purpose and meaning. He's, he can make a good hedger. Might not be the tidiest, but it's going to keep the cattle in, you know. So, so this is, you know, there's place, there's place for people here. So, um, what we're finding with the trainees coming forwards, we have a lot of people coming through that are maybe on the spectrum. They may come with social anxiety, particularly the younger people. The classic phrase we hear is, I don't fit this century. It's one we use ourselves as hedges. I don't fit the century. And that's what they come to us with. And what we find through the work is that we set it up, we teach, and then the work does it itself. The hedge does the work. The hedge teaches these young people how to hedge, but it not only teaches them how to hedge, it teaches them calm and quiet camaraderie and stillness and peace because the work is just therapy. It's like a big outdoor jigsaw. And it's just, we kind of know that ourselves as hedgers, but we haven't, uh, for me, I haven't really thought about it. I just know that I need to garden, I need to hedge. When I'm out of sorts, I'm just going to need to put my hands in the earth somewhere. And what's so obvious to us is that the hedge is therapy. This, this work is like, it's doing what meditation would do, but it has, at the end of the day, you've built something that's going to last at least 100 years. It has value and practical purpose. So it's so valuable, it's so valuable. But I nearly to took this out and I had to check with my husband and said, look, this is slight grace. But actually, a few times lately I've said we're like the Wombles. You know, hopefully everybody knows the Wombles here, you know, sort of. But basically, we are like granite Wombles. We use the waste material. We are the recyclers. We are the reusers. We need waste subsoil. We really struggle to get it because the haulage companies think it's a pain to drive it to the training site so there's some work that needs to be done here because we use the granite that's no good for building you know and we use the waste products the subsoil that's coming out of build sites and roadworks that's what we need so we are our footprint our carbon footprint is really low we really are we really tread lightly on the earth we don't you know a lot of us don't use diggers we might just have a wheelbarrow a shovel and a hammer and we have the material brought in that's the only diesel coming into it. The rest of it is just work by hand. So we are Wombles. What we do as Wombles, though, is nurture intelligent hands. And back to the Industrial Revolution, you know, we've grown up with three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. That was just, that's what the Industrial Revolution gave us. And it served its purpose. But there's another way of looking at it. and and. Satish Kumar, that was a co-founder of Schumacher College, he believes in a philosophy of head, hands, and heart in terms of work. And that sort of sits kind of more comfortably with me, I think, as I've got older, just thinking, actually, there's another way of looking at teaching and education. 
what I love about this is turning ordinary, ordinary into extraordinary. We've got the roughest stone. We've got the ugliest, roughest stone. And out of it, out of that chaos, we create beauty out of that chaos. So, on work. This, this was the course we ran this week. I love this photo because um, this lad James in the red coat closest to me is profoundly deaf. He can only lip read, so when I was working with him, we, it was really interesting, that kind of relationship, because I had to make sure he could sort of hear me. But we worked really well together, and Sean on the other side has got learning difficulties. He can smack a stone. God, you know, he's, all I had to do is score. Well, right, I want that off there, score that, and then just stand back, because he's just <laughs> whack. And it's like, move it up, move it up. You know, that was, and so we spent most of that time, and uh, most of the time, going through a list and list of 80s music that he loved. But this, we were the kind of factory elves for the hedge work was actually going on to the left. So we built a hedge with, um, this is on, with United Response. So we had five members of staff and three learners. And it was the most rewarding course I think I've ever taught on because it just shows how diverse this is how rewarding it was. They stuck at it all week, all week, which was a real surprise for the staff. Five days of training and they came every day and the staff were expecting them to kind of maybe do three days and then get a bit fed up, but they stuck at it even on the last day when it was really getting pretty wet. So on work, Khalil Gibran is a sort of favorite poet I just, I love, but it's about work, we need to work. It's how we feel seasons. It's how we're part of the earth. It's how we're in rhythm. All of us need to work. All of us. And then this one's interesting because someone that I sing with said to me, she's a counsellor, and she said, what about the crystals? What about the crystals in, in, the, in the granite? What are they doing for you in terms of, like, you know, the healing properties of crystal? Never thought about it at all. But I had a quick look up. And what's so interesting, what sort of popped up as a quick Google search was self-esteem, self-awareness, emotional stability. That's what we're seeing on the hedge. This is another lovely photo, amazing setting. This is on the edge of Mount Edgecombe. This is a course that we ran in September. I didn't teach on this, the other trainers were. Now, this is for Secure Forest, and they are veterans coming out of war, so they might have had post-traumatic stress disorder, or they might have struggled <coughs> coming back into civilian life. They've had low points. They've had low points, and they need to kind of basically come back in again. They need to find meaning and purpose in work. I love that photo because, you know, to me, that's somebody having a really good time um, who's probably had a really crap time. And, uh, yeah, I love that photo. Another really exciting partnership. So some of you in the room might recognise yourselves here. Talking about presence and being present within the work, present in yourself within the work. Quite often on a training course, there'll be a day, maybe on the fourth day, there could be a whole morning where you've got seven or eight hedges working together and all you can hear is tap, 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 tap. There's, and they might be standing like all a metre apart from each other and there's just this quiet, still camaraderie and presence in the, in the work. The stone is so absorbing, there isn't time for that mental chatter and oh, what I've got to do tomorrow, I've got to check my emails tonight and all that. It's just not there, it's not there because the stone takes that attention. And I love that photo. I don't know what we're laughing at, but obviously something, some, somebody says something funny, but it's just great. It's just that, that's the end of a training course, and that's just this sort of pleasure in each other's company, having spent a week together. So, and this is my last slide. Okay. Am I on it? Am I, how have I done? Yeah, you, well, you, I'm you, over. No, you're not. Oh, no. you, God, you've got, you've got three, minutes, three minutes to go. There won't be many okay, okay, questions. Okay, so. okay, well, I'm not going to leave that. So, everybody else can leave that themselves. Wendell Berry to me is incredibly inspirational. So really, this is about coming right back full circle to where we are, where we are with land, where we are with a sense of belonging, where we are with sort of honouring and looking after this land. One of the things that I might have to do soon because it's been brewing up and I talked about it to some of the trainees this week. On the training site where I am, there's a, there's a holy well. I'm, the training site is very near Carn Uni Holy Well. And I know... I'm sure, I can feel it in my bones, that in the Bronze Age, when they'd built their hedge, there would have been some sort of ceremony, some offering, <laughs> something to say they built the hedge. So anyway, I think, I think the next 
the next hedge that I build, even if I do it discreetly and quietly on my own, I'm going to get into some of that little well water and I'm going to bless the hedge on the top. So I'm going to pour, pour some well water on our next hedge that we build and bless it because just in honour of our ancestors, just so that give my, my life a little bit more meaning as well. But the more I talk about this stuff, the more it resonates. I know there's people that think this stuff as well. Um, that's my last slide. That is it.